The full fan-translated version of Baruto, Two Blue Vortex, Chapter 16 has finally dropped, and there's so much to unpack. Keep in mind that these are unofficial translations, so some details might change when the official release is out. Before we dive into breaking down this exciting chapter, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on more Baruto content like this. Now, let's jump straight into the main topic of today's video. Chapter 16 features Ida on the cover, setting the stage for a storyline that heavily revolves around her. Let's explore what this means and break down all the key moments. The chapter kicks off with an intriguing flashback showing Baruto training under Kashin Koji. It's revealed that Koji was teaching Baruto the principles of the flying Raijin technique. He explains that space-time ninjutsu allows for the instantaneous transfer of objects or people to any location, akin to the ability to fly possessed by the Otsutsuki. Koji reminds Baruto that he had previously manifested space-time ninjutsu, but only in uncontrolled bursts under specific circumstances. Now, after six years of rigorous training, Baruto has finally mastered control over this ability. Koji breaks down the basics of the flying Raijin, explaining that it works by marking ninja tools with chakra, enabling the user to teleport freely to those marked tools. This technique, famously specialized by Minato Namikaze, is held as a benchmark for mastery in space-time ninjutsu. Interestingly, Koji encourages Baruto to name his technique since Baruto's version of the flying Raijin is a unique variation. Baruto achieved the same results as the original, but with a personal twist that sets it apart. In response, Baruto quips, creating it, huh? Are you a genius? Right now, all I feel is pressure. This moment highlights both Baruto's respect for the monumental task and his growing confidence as he steps into his own legacy. On the next page, we see Baruto actively practicing the flying Raijin, honing his control and precision. Kashin Koji explains that the most effective medium for channeling chakra is a ninja tool. After extensive trial and error, this method was determined to be the optimal solution. Baruto then asks if his sword can be used as a medium for the technique. Koji confirms, explaining that any ninja tool can work as a medium for teleportation. However, he clarifies that the teleportation becomes more accurate and easier if the tool is within visible range. When Baruto inquires about the difficulty of teleporting over long distances, Koji provides an example. If a marked shuriken is far away, say to the north or south, Baruto can sense the chakra of the medium he wants to teleport to. However, if there are multiple marked tools in the same area, it becomes challenging to distinguish between them. On the other hand, if only one marked tool is present, the teleportation process is straightforward. Koji points out that this limitation prevents Baruto from fully exploiting the convenience of the technique. To address this, Koji and Baruto brainstorm ways to improve the method. They consider using objects with distinct shapes and symbols as mediums, allowing Baruto to associate specific figures with each marked location. This strategy could make teleportation to distant locations more manageable. However, Koji warns that long-distance teleportation requires significantly more focus and mental clarity. Baruto acknowledges the challenge, remarking, this is going to be some serious training. This moment underscores Baruto's determination to master a complex technique while adapting it to his unique style. Kaji Koji emphasizes to Baruto how remarkable his progress is, stating that what typically takes years of theoretical knowledge and practice, Baruto has managed to grasp in just minutes. However, he reminds Baruto that mastery of the flying Raijin will only come with consistent and rigorous training. Baruto reassures him, vowing to continue honing his skills, knowing that the challenges ahead will demand his best transitions back to their hideout, where Baruto and Koji discuss the future. Baruto suggests they inform others about the potential futures, both good and bad, to gain their cooperation in steering events in a favorable direction. Koji, however, advises against this. He explains that the more people are aware of the future, the more unpredictable it becomes. Sharing such knowledge could alter the flow of destiny itself, making future predictions unreliable. Koji further elaborates, saying that knowing the future is not simply a gift, but an act of drawing the future. The more they reveal, the greater the risk of individuals deviating from their destined paths. Thus, it's better for Baruto and Koji to keep this knowledge to themselves, using it strategically to support their journey toward a better future from behind the scenes. Koji points out that Baruto, like himself, has become a singularity, someone who stands apart from the normal flow of fate. As their conversation unfolds, the scene shifts to Ida, who is spying on them. Intrigued by their exchange, she quietly repeats the phrase, singularity of fate, hinting that she too recognizes the significance of Baruto's unique position. This sets the stage for a deeper exploration of fate, free will, and the role Baruto will play in shaping the future. Back in Konoha, we see Sarada and Sumirai questioning Ada about what she learned. Ada reveals that Baruto doesn't want to share much because he has his own reasons, primarily to prevent any harm from coming to them. Sarada acknowledges this might be true but expresses concern that Baruto is carrying the entire burden alone. With Konoha facing a common enemy, 
She insists that she wants to help Baruto, even if he doesn't ask for it. Sumire then chimes in, pointing out that Baruto seems to want to remain unseen and unnoticed. While they openly support him, she admits they don't have much critical information about his plans or motives. Serata counters, arguing that facing enemies alone is reckless, and she believes Baruto shouldn't have to shoulder everything by himself. Sumire questions Serata's perspective, asking if she's truly considered Baruto's feelings. She suggests that perhaps respecting his desire for solitude is the better option. Then, in a surprising shift, Sumire asks Serata a pointed question. Did Serata ever consider her feelings? Sumire refers to the time when Serata didn't hesitate to embrace Baruto after reuniting with him. She implies that Serata acted without regard for her, despite knowing how deeply Sumire feels for Baruto. This unexpected confrontation leaves Serata and Ida stunned, with the latter noting how awkward and tense the situation has become, but unable to intervene. Tension boils over as Sumire storms out of the room. Serata calls after her, addressing her as class rep, but Sumire sharply retorts, How long are you going to keep calling me that? Her response underscores a deeper frustration, both with the label and perhaps with Serata's perceived insensitivity. This emotionally charged scene highlights the growing complexities in their relationships, adding another layer of tension to an already high-stakes narrative. The scene shifts as Shikamaru contacts Ada, informing her that there's something important he wants to discuss. Meanwhile, the narrative cuts to a conversation between the feudal lord and the village elders. The feudal lord voices his frustration over Konoha's failure to detain Baruto after capturing him, accusing the village of incompetence. The elders agree, acknowledging there's no valid excuse for this failure. The feudal lord then demands Baruto's immediate capture and execution, warning that if Konoha cannot resolve the matter, someone more appropriate will need to step in. In response, the elders assure him they will act decisively to fulfill his wishes. Returning to Shikamaru and Ada, Shikamaru admits he'd rather avoid meeting with Ada face to face, explaining that her presence clouds his mind and slows his thought process. He adds that he doesn't want the sensory team overhearing him when he's in such a vulnerable state. Shikamaru asks Ada about recent developments in the Sand Village. Ada reveals a startling piece of information. A new Shinju has been born, named Ryu, whose origins lie with Shinki. She explains that Ryu's target is Gara, and that Gara has already been sealed. However, Ryu has the ability to undo the seal at will since it's his own technique. Recognizing the urgency, Shikamaru states that he will immediately organize a team to rescue Gara, as his life is in grave danger. Ida then shifts the conversation, revealing another concern. She mentions footage of Bug, an unusual individual who has proven to be highly troublesome. According to Ada, Bug possesses the ability to monitor her even when she's using her Senrigan. When Shikamaru asks if this is some kind of unique ability, Ada responds with unease, admitting that her blood runs cold at the thought of looking at him. This revelation introduces a new layer of mystery and potential threat, raising the stakes for Konoha and its allies. Ida explains that she will avoid observing the Shinju in real time, due to the unsettling presence of Bug. Shikamaru agrees with her decision, and advises her not to overexert herself. He asks her to report any significant findings as soon as she discovers them. Ida then drops a bombshell. She accuses Shikamaru of being the one who allowed Baruto to escape, using Mitsuki as part of his plan. When Shikamaru feigns ignorance, Ida warns him not to play dumb. However, she reassures him that she won't disclose this to anyone in Konoha, as it aligns with her own interests. And more importantly, she doesn't want to make things more difficult for Baruto. Ada goes on to reveal that for now, Baruto and Kawaki have agreed to join forces. She emphasizes that if they intend to address the Shinju threat, Konoha should avoid interfering with Baruto and Kawaki's actions. Shikamaru, showing his sharp intuition, asks Ada about a mysterious individual assisting Baruto. He notes that he has seen a toad being used by this person before, and concludes that it must be Kashin Koji. At that moment, one of Kashin Koji's toads suddenly appears on Ida's hair. The toad acknowledges Shikamaru's perceptiveness and confirms that he is correct. Through the toad, Kashin Koji directly communicates with Shikamaru. He advises him to send Konohamaru, Sarada, and Mitsuki to the Land of Wind, hinting that their presence there will be crucial. This revelation sets the stage for an imminent and critical mission, raising questions about what awaits the team in the Land of Wind and how Kashinkoji's involvement will influence the unfolding events. Kashinkoji continues his message, informing Shikamaru that the Shinju, Ryu, or Matsuri, will likely appear in the Land of Wind. He insists that Konohamaru's team should work alongside two sand ninja to eliminate them. When Shikamaru demands an explanation and a valid reason for all this, Koji curtly tells him not to ask questions. Instead, 
Koji suggests Shikamaru come up with a plausible excuse if Konohamaru's team shows reluctance. Koji then shifts focus to Himawari, advising Shikamaru to allow her to leave the village. He explains that she is being targeted by an individual named Jura. By venturing outside Konoha, she might attract Jura's attention, putting her in grave danger. If that happens, Koji warns, Himawari's life would be at risk. Koji elaborates further, revealing that Jura holds a deep respect for Konoha's cultural values and is unwilling to engage in battle within the village itself. As long as nothing extraordinary happens, Konoha remains a safe haven for the time being. Koji even mentions an odd scenario. If Jura were to visit a bookstore in Konoha, he should be treated as an ordinary customer. A stunned Shikamaru interrupts, incredulously asking Koji if he is being serious. Koji calmly responds, stressing that this is no joke. He emphasizes that the most crucial thing is to avoid provoking Jura. If Jura gets serious, Koji warns, defeating him will be impossible. To that end, Shikamaru's strategy should focus on minimizing engagement with Jura, defeating his allies with only the necessary force, and immediately fleeing if Jura himself appears. As Koji's toad prepares to leave, Shikamaru urgently calls out for it to wait. As the scene continues, Kashin Koji expresses his gratitude to Shikamaru for helping Baruto escape, even at the cost of defying village rules and the will of his comrades. Koji acknowledges Shikamaru's courage in following his heart to achieve something meaningful. He reassures Shikamaru that he won't impose any further decisions on him, leaving it up to Shikamaru to choose his path moving forward. With that, Koji departs. Shikamaru sighs, muttering, Good grief. What a hassle. The scene then shifts to Sumira, who is seen reflecting on and regretting her earlier confrontation with Sarada. The atmosphere is heavy with tension and introspection. In the next panel, Team 7 arrives in the Land of Wind. Sarada appears noticeably downcast, likely dwelling on her strained interaction with Sumiri. Mitsuki, ever observant, asks if something is bothering her. Sarada brushes it off, insisting that nothing is wrong and asking him not to worry. Konohamaru, trying to keep the team focused, reminds them not to space out, warning that the San Shinobi might make fun of them if they appear distracted. Soon after, they are greeted by San Shinobi Araya and Yodo, who warmly welcome Konohamaru and his team to the Land of Wind. Konohamaru wastes no time, instructing everyone to head to their designated destination immediately. Upon arrival, Mitsuki questions Konohamaru about the source of Shikamaru's information. Konohamaru admits that he doesn't know the exact details but has been assured that the intel is reliable. Meanwhile, Yodo notices Sarada's subdued demeanor and comments on how much her vibe has changed. With a teasing smile, she asks if it's because of a man's taste. Sarada awkwardly denies it, prompting Yodo to respond, Yeah, it's fine though. As they reach their destination, Konohamaru uses a telescope to scout the area. He spots the enemies, Ryu and Matsuri, the Shinju, and notes that they've captured one of Kashin Koji's toads. Matsuri declares that the toad is a valuable clue that could lead them to Baruto. The chapter ends on this ominous note, heightening the tension as Team 7 braces for the confrontation ahead. That's it for today's breakdown of Baruto, 2 Blue Vortex Chapter 16. Things are definitely heating up with Team 7 heading into action and the Shinju's plans becoming clearer. What do you think will happen next? Will Konohamaru's team be able to handle Ryu and Matsuri, or is an even greater threat waiting for them? Let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you never miss out on more Baruto content like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Stay sharp, Shinobi.